So today, the title of my talk is going to be Daylight to Dreamland, Light's Effect on Sleep and Sleepiness, because this is a topic that is very interesting to me, and I think a, a good chunk of my work has focused on it. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So I, I always like to start off with a, a small reminder to, to the people in the audience that in the end, humans are diurnal. And what I try to say with that is that generally we're active when the sun is out and generally we're not active when the sun goes down. And this is how it used to be, obviously, before the emergence of electrical lighting. And electrical lighting really changed our relationship with light because it extended our ability to stay up beyond dusk. So basically, the emergence of lighting made sure that we could do things after the sun has set. And by doing so, it changed our behavior because it didn't mean that once the sun has set, you go to bed. It means that you can actually do things. And this changed our behavior a lot. And this is one of the topics that is very interesting to me and that we study in the lab quite regularly. And it's funny because I always put this this. Um, um, slide in and this is not a sketch or anything i made up like this is the actual advertisement of the edison electrical light bulb and on the on the bottom it says this small disclaimer the use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health nor does it affect the soundness of sleep and i think by now we know that it's a lot more complicated than that it's not so simple and i think there's plenty of proof that it can be harmful for health and sleep um, especially at certain circadian clock phases. But we'll get into all of that today. Um, so, of course, for those who do not know, the non-image forming effects of light, they go through the rods, the cones, and the IPRGCs. So basically through the eye, um, where we have cells that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light, so either shorter um, or longer wavelengths of light. And depending on how what kind of light information we get, this information is getting transmitted through the brain. So light enters the eye and through the retinal hypothalamic tract, goes through the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which of course is the master pacemaker of the circadian clock. So this is where circadian rhythms are really regulated. Now, very interesting work coming from Tiffany Schmidt's lab is, has shown that IPRGCs, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, are very much contributing to these non-image forming effects of light, and that this doesn't always have to go through the SCN. So different subtypes of IPRGCs that are all located in the eye project all throughout the brain to nuclei that are the SCN, but also that are not the SCN, and that are the directly associated with other functions, including uh, the VLPO for sleep, for example, the lateral hypothalamus, and, and many, many other nuclei. So you can imagine that there are direct effects of light on cognition, alertness, and sleep through all these kinds of projections. And we're going to explore a couple of these today. So today I want to talk a little bit about the light effects on circadian clock phase, on alertness and on sleep. So we'll start with the circadian clock. And I think the best way to explain the circadian clock to people who do not know it, but who do travel, is like the inability to fall asleep when you want to and the inability to stay awake when you also want to. So for example, maybe you recognize it as, as fellow scientists, like you go to a meeting and you travel over multiple time zones and by the time that you get there and you actually have to pay attention, you're unable to pay attention because your circadian clock is pushing for sleep. And at the same time, you're unable to go to bed when you want to go to bed because your circadian clock is pushing for wakefulness. And this has been beautifully correct, characterized in a phase response curve um, uh, by Kalsa et al. in 2003 in which you have circadian phase on the x-axis and the phase shift on the y-axis. And what this graph tells us is that depending on at which time of day or at which phase of the circadian clock you're exposing yourself to lighting, you're going to get a phase shift in a certain direction. So if you get exposed to lighting right before your normal bedtime, you get a maximal phase delay. And if you get exposed to lighting right before or right after waking up, you get a maximal phase advance. Meaning that if you want to go visit me in California and you're in Germany with a nine hour time difference, you need to maximally phase delay your circadian clock. Whereas if you go to Japan or um, um, Asia from Europe, you have to maxima maximally phase advance your circadian clock. So speed up your circadian clock or slow down your circadian clock. 
And you can do this with continuous lights, and that's what this phase response curve is based on. So depending on when you expose yourself to continuous light, you can change your circadian clock. However, it's a relatively sluggish process in which, you know, one hour of bright light exposure can shift your clock a little bit. So we were interested to explore if light of, um, uh, if flashes of light can also significantly change your circadian clock. And we tried to target the phase delay. So we actually had our participants come in, go to sleep, and about half hour after they went to sleep, we exposed them to flashes of light through goggles while they were asleep. And this is what the goggles look like, so they're in no way fashionable, but that's okay. So people sleep with these, and while they are asleep, they're being exposed to two milliseconds of flashes of broad spectrum lighting, uh, delivered every 15 seconds for about 60 minutes. And we're trying to target, again, the maximal phase delay zone. And if we do that, interestingly, we see that the phase delays are really, really large. So here is under placebo conditions. So these participants come in twice. Once they wear these goggles, but there are no light flashes. And once they wear these goggles and they get the light flashes, and you see that there are big phase delays. And there's a big spread, so large inter-individual differences. Some individuals shift more than others, with one individual actually shifting more than six hours. Meaning that if you go to sleep and your time zone is Europe or Paris, you basically wake up in New York if you're exposed to these flashes. So these flashes of light are much more efficient compared to continuous light at shifting your circadian clock. And they're about three times larger. So it's a really, really good way to adjust your circadian clock. And interestingly, we can do this without affecting sleep. So of course, these participants are hooked up on a bunch of EEGs. So we're trying to measure sleep, what happens in the brain. And these are all the different stages of sleep that we, that we looked at and at the number of transitions from deep to light sleep and from sleep to wake to see if there were any differences when people were exposed to the flashes versus the, the placebo control. And there are some differences, but nothing major and nothing significant, meaning that indeed you can be exposed to these flashes, change your circadian clock phase and not be uh, disturbed in how you sleep. So this is really nice. So you can go to sleep in Paris and wake up in New York. Quite awesome. And why should we care? I would say because all uh, bodily functions have a circadian component. And I mean, I put a question mark there because I'm sure there are some bodily functions that we have not proven circadian rhythms in, but I think either they will come or there's something really peculiar about them because I think almost all bodily functions have circadian components. And I always like to give this kind of example. So this is data that we analyzed of Olympic swimmers participating in four different Olympic Games in Athens, Beijing, London, and Rio de Janeiro. And if you plot out how they swim, how fast they swim, um, you can see a circadian curve. Basically meaning these swimmers that optimize for anything, that travel to the games weeks or sometimes even months in advance, that train at any time of day, that optimize their food, that optimize their sleep, there's still a circadian or diurnal rhythm in their swim performance, such that they perform significantly better in the late afternoon. So 4 p.m. And that means that if you're an Olympic swimmer, it's very important to optimize your circadian clock. And that means that if your game is actually in the morning, you may consider shifting your clock in such a way that for your biological clock, it's actually the late afternoon because you will perform a lot better. And of course, it's always really hard to quantify the magnitude of such effects. And I think it's always important to quantify the size, because in the end, you want to indicate how important is it to care about your circadian rhythm. And if we stick to these Olympic swimmers, we can see that the amplitude of this curve is about 0.4%, which of course small, sounds extremely small. But if you look at what the difference is between finishing first and second, or second and third, the amplitude of this circadian curve is larger than the difference, the time difference between finishing first and second in 40% of the cases and second and third in 64% of the cases. So for Olympic swimmers, it really, really makes a massive difference if you perform at the right time of day or if you don't. 
Now let's focus on my favorite topic, alertness, in which the circadian clock is also extremely important. So for those who do not know what exactly is alertness, so it's a state of being vigilant, watchful, and attentive to one's surroundings. You're mentally aware and ready to respond quickly to stimuli, um, potential dangers or changes in the environment. And an alert person is typically focused, observant, and able to react promptly to various situations. It is essential for maintaining awareness, for making decisions, and ensuring quick responses when necessary. And we usually try to assess someone's alertness in a multi-measure approach. So we use self-report. We'll ask, how alert do you feel on a certain scale? We'll measure physiology, so brain waves through electroencephalography. So we attach electrodes to the skull, we measure brain waves. And how well do you cognitively perform? So usually on quite simple, boring reaction time tasks, we see how long can you maintain attention. And very regularly, it's assessed as lapses or decrements in attention. So if you're not paying attention at all, then we will know. So high intensity lighting can influence alertness at night. So this is beautiful work done by Christian Kajochen in the early 2000s, where they show a dose dependent relationship between alertness and light intensity. Basically meaning at low intensity lighting, you don't feel so alert. But if you increase light intensity, there's a steep increase in alertness. So people start to feel much more alert. And this effect evens out at a certain point. So at a certain point, it doesn't matter how much more lighting you're going to get. You're never going to feel more alert. So this is what we call a dose-dependent relationship. And it's not just subjective alertness. It works the same for EEG power density. So this physiological measure of alertness. So beautiful dose-dependent relationship. But I started off by saying, you know, humans are diurnal. We're active during the day and we usually sleep at night. So it's very important to know if this beautiful dose-dependent relationship, if it also exists during the daytime, because this is when we are active, when we cognitively have to perform and when we do our work. So that's when we need to be alert. And we try to replicate this dose response curve during the day at different time windows in the early morning, in the slightly later morning, in the early afternoon and the late afternoon. And this is under semi-controlled conditions. With that, I mean that the participants slept in the lab and we try to standardize lots, lots of our um, uh, confounding factors. But we could not find any dose-dependent relationship. So here again, we have subjective sleepiness, and this is standardized. So these are Z-transformed scores. So they look a bit different than the other scores. But basically, or more importantly, we can see that none of these follow a dose-dependent pattern, right? Like it's more or less random, meaning that during the day, light does not induce alertness in a dose-dependent matter at all. Subjective alertness, that is. And I started off by saying, that in the retina, in the eye, we have these different photoreceptors that are sensitive to different wavelengths. So you can also play around with wavelengths and take a look at fluorescent lighting or white lighting or blue and rich white lighting, which we usually expect to have a bigger effect because it stimulates these melanopsin cells, these IPRGCs, if that can induce alertness. And we did that in a different experiment. And here we used a different scale. But in the end, what is most important is you see that these bars are completely overlapping. Meaning it doesn't matter to which spectral composition, so which colors of lighting you are exposed during the daytime, also that cannot induce alertness. So neither high intensity lighting nor the spectral composition of lighting can induce subjective alertness during the day. Now, there is a problem with this because alertness is not a simple construct. It's driven by the circadian clock and homeostatic sleep pressure. And this is a, a very classic representation of the two process model of sleep, where you have the circadian clock depicted in the dotted line and homeostatic sleep pressure in the black solid line. Basically meaning your circadian clock is sometimes pushing for wake, driving for wake, and sometimes driving for sleep. And this cycles with a rhythm of approximately 24 hours. But you have this component of homeostatic sleep pressure, which is low when you wake up and increases during the day. And by the time that you go to sleep and your circadian clock is promoting sleep, you fall asleep and your process S, so your homeostatic sleep pressure decreases. 
And that means that if we compare the results that have been conducted during the night by Christian Kajochen to our results in which we look at high intensity lighting and lighting of different spectral compositions during the day, we have a problem because we don't know what is the difference between nighttime alertness and daytime alertness because both the circadian clock here is promoting sleep and homeostatic sleep pressure is high because you've been awake for a long time. Whereas in our experiments that are happening during the day, the circadian clock is promoting wake and homeostatic sleep pressure is relatively low because you've just woken up. So if we really want to understand what differentiates daytime alertness from nighttime alertness, we have to disentangle these two concepts. So we have to disentangle process C from process S. And one way of doing that is in a forced synchrony design. So this is under highly, highly controlled circumstances. So basically people enter our human isolation facility and we keep them there for five consecutive days and under highly controlled circumstances. So we control what they eat, when they eat, when they sleep and what kind of lighting they are uh, exposed to. And what we do is we put them on an alternative light dark cycle with five hours for sleep and 13 hours for wakefulness. And this is such an odd light dark cycle. So this is an 18 hour light dark cycle, which is so far from 24 hours that your circadian clock cannot entrain to this light dark cycle. It's too far outside the scope of entrainment. And that entails that your circadian clock will be free running. So ticking according to its own internal circadian phase. And because the circadian clock just runs at its own circadian phase and you sleep at different phases of the circadian clock, we can mathematically separate out the effect of the circadian clock from homeostatic sleep pressure. So for example, here you go to bed at 6 p.m. and here you go to bed at noon. And therefore, because you sleep and are awake at different circadian clock phases, we can take apart these two. And we conducted this for synchrony design once under dim light conditions of about five lux and once under high intensity uh, conditions of about 1500 lux in the same individuals. So these individuals came to our human isolation facility twice. So that's big, uh, quite, uh, quite a big ask. So we have, we have some awesome participants. It's one of the most shocking facts is usually we take away any information about time of day. So they cannot have electronics. They don't have their phones. So they're willingly came to be locked up in our human isola isolation facility twice for five days. So what do the results show us? If we look at process S, so the effect of homeostatic sleep pressure, we see a beautiful effect in subjective alertness, such that people wake up relatively alert, so lower is more alert, and they go to bed relatively sleepy. So there's a trajectory from alertness to sleepiness. But if we look at cognitive performance, sustained attention and response inhibition, we see a different pattern in which there's not such a big effect of how long they've been awake. They perform equally well when they just woken up compared to when they go to bed. And this accounts for both sustained attention on the PVT and for response inhibition on the go-no-go -no -go reaction time task. And this is under dim light of five lux. So what happens if we put them under bright light of 1300 lux? We see a different image. So for subjective alertness, People under high intensity lighting, they wake up relatively alert and they go to bed relatively sleepy. So that is the same as under dim light conditions. But the trajectory from alert to sleepy is very different. So people stay alert for longer under high intensity lighting. So they feel alert for longer when they're exposed to bright light. If we look at cognitive performance, so PVT performance and go no go performance, we see a different image in which people under high intensity lighting actually always perform better. So here you see over the entire duration of being awake, people press the buttons faster under high intensity lighting than under dim lighting. So that's quite a big difference where we see that our multi-measure approach is actually telling us different things for the different concepts that we measure. So this is the effects for process S, homeostatic sleep pressure. So what happens if we add circadian variation? So what does the circadian clock do? And here we have the circadian, sorry, circadian sleep window approximately. Oh, let me do it like this. So if we look at alertness, subjective alertness, we see an increase in sleepiness after and during the circadian 
um, sleep window. So after production of melatonin and sleepiness or alertness increases during the circadian wake day when the circadian clock is promoting sleep. So there's a very strong circadian component. It's a beautiful curve. If we look at cognitive performance, there is a circadian component, but it's not as strong. The amplitude is much smaller. So there is a circadian component, but very small. And then if we add our bright light condition, what do we see? It's a small reduction in amplitude. So under high intensity lighting, subjective sleepiness shows a smaller size of the curve. And there's again, this one point where subjective alertness is a lot better right after waking up actually. But if we look at cognitive performance, subject, uh, sorry, if we look at cognitive performance, there is an increase in performance all throughout almost all circadian clock phases. So individuals perform a lot better under high intensity lighting, depending on the circadian clock phase. Now, forces synchrony designs are, are a very elegant way of disentangling these, these two components, but we always have more or less relative levels of sleep pressure because we did a brief force to synchrony design. So five hours for sleep, 13 hours for wakefulness. There's a certain accumulation of sleep pressure, but not a lot. So to really play around with this, we also did a sleep deprivation experiment. And basically we kept our participants up for two hours, for four hours, six hours, eight hours, or eight hours. Sorry, I made an error here. So, um, zero, two, four, six, or eight hours of sleep deprivation. And then we expose them to high intensity lighting in the, ne the next morning at the same time of day. And what we can see is if you have a little bit of sleep deprivation, so only zero or two hours, there's not really an effect of lighting. So if you're then exposed to high intensity lighting, there's a little change in alertness, but not that much. But if you're sleep deprived four to six hours, you have a big alerting effect of light. So if you're sleep deprived for four or six hours, light can induce alertness. However, if you're sleep deprived for more, so up to eight hours, there's no alerting effect of light. And this kind of leads us to believe that light can induce alertness, but only at very specific combinations of circadian clock phase and homeostatic sleep pressure. So here, when you've got a little bit of sleep pressure, there's an alerting effect of light. When there's too much, light is not strong enough to elicit this alerting effect. And when you're too alert, there's more or less a ceiling effect because you're already alert. So how much more alert can you get? So there's a very specific point at which light can induce alertness. And then the big question of course becomes, okay, if we take this all back and we combine these data sets, can we make a prediction what happens during the regular day? So as I'm sitting in my office right now, is it gonna matter if I'm exposed to high intensity lighting or if I'm here more or less in the dark? So you can generate uh, um, a heat map in which we put our time since sleep offset, so process S on the X axis from the force synchrony experiment. And we put on the Y axis sleep duration. So um, from our sleep deprivation experiment on the Y axis. And we can see, so green is a light induced improvement in sleepiness. We can see that there are very limited combinations of times in sleep offset and sleep deprivation where you can find an effect of light. Meaning that if you had a full night of sleep, so you slept eight hours and you know, you're exposed to high intensity lighting, you're not gonna find any effects of lighting. Four hours also no. After eight hours, there might be a small effect. After that, the effect is gone. Meaning that there's a very specific combination of how much sleep you have gotten and how long you've been awake when light can induce a little bit of alertness. Interestingly, if we look at cognitive performance, and this is on the PVT, so a simple reaction time task, we see a completely different image where it does not matter how much time since sleep offset and how much sleep you've gotten, you will always perform better. And this leads us to believe that it's always favorable to be in high intensity lighting because even though you will not perceive as if you're doing a lot better um, alertness wise, you perform a lot better cognitively, at least on simple reaction time tasks. And interestingly, we found similar results depending on the color of light. So if we go back to the spectral composition, so a different experiment that we ran, we find a similar effect. So again, we have no effect in our subjective sleepiness depending on 
which kind of color of lighting we use, but we see an effect on how well people perform. And these are different tasks. So these are higher order cognitive processing tasks. So basically a little bit more complicated than the other reaction time tasks that we did, including the digit symbol substitution task, which is for visual scanning, the fractal two bag, which assesses working memory and emotion recognition task, which is for rec recognizing facial emotions. And we see that individuals perform a lot better on these tasks under blue enriched white light, even though they're not um, less sleepy. So they perform better. And this is an incredibly strong effect because if you plot out the individual trajectories between dim light and blue and rich white light, we see that almost every single individual in our experiment performs significantly better under high intensity lighting, except for maybe one. So this is a very consistent effect, leading us to conclude that either high intensity lighting or lighting of bluer spectral composition can improve your cognitive performance during the day, while it does not necessarily influence your subjective sleepiness. So what about sleep? If we're exposed to a ton of light during the day, is it gonna influence how we sleep at night? So, and I, I think everybody in the audience probably um, heard a lot about light at night and it influences on nighttime sleep because I mean, the media will not stop talking about it. And I mean, rightfully so. I think light at night is very detrimental for sleep and sleep quality. Um, and there are lots of headlines out there that talk about it. But I do think coming back to my beginning message, you know, light enables us to stay up after dusk. So in that sense, light enables us to do things when the sun goes down and change our behavior. But in the end, we are battling with human behavior. And the fact that you're exposed to maybe high intensity lighting in the evening, it can have an effect on your sleep. But I don't know how big that effect is relative to your human behavior, your drive for staying up because you want to binge watch the next show. So I think there's always a trade-off between the real effect of light versus what light enables us to do. And I think that's important to consider. So for those who do not know what exactly is sleep, it is a natural and recurring state of reduced consciousness and inactivity. It's characterized by decreased sensory awareness and a temporary suspension of voluntary muscle activity. And it consists of different stages, including rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep, each serving specific functions in the overall sleep process. So we usually assess it in a multi-measure approach again. So polysomnography, attaching electrodes to the skull and deriving sleep stages from that and self-report. So how well do you feel that you slept? And importantly, and I think this is something that we're discovering more and more, sleep plays such a crucial role in processes such as memory consolidation, immune system function, physical restoration, and it's essential for overall health and mental well-being. Um, so I cannot stress enough how important sleep is for, for everything, for feeling well, performing well, and, and doing well. So in our forced asynchrony, of course, we also measured sleep. So during this window of five hours for sleep, we also had our participants hooked up to electrodes and we wanted to see if there was an effect of being exposed to high intensity lighting or dim light, and if that influenced how they slept. And if we look at it, so if we look at sleep opportunity one, which happens when the circadian clock more or less is promoting sleep, starting to promote sleep, and light exposure happened when the circadian clock was promoting wakefulness, so during the regular day. We don't see too many effects on sleep. So this is the amount of non-REM sleep, REM sleep, and wakefulness. And there's no significant differences between being exposed to high-intensity lighting, the red line, or uh, dim light, the blue line. But... If we look at our other sleep opportunities, sleep two and sleep three, which happen when the circadian clock is promoting wakefulness and when light exposure occurs when the circadian clock is promoting sleep, we see a significant effect of high intensity light exposure. So especially in sleep opportunity two, where the circadian clock is really promoting sleep while you're being exposed to high intensity lighting. If you go to sleep after that, we see more accumulation of non-REM sleep, deep sleep, um, not really an effect on REM sleep, but we also see less wakefulness, meaning that people sleep deeper and they wake up less when they're exposed to high intensity lighting while the circadian clock is promoting sleep. And this effect also accounts for sleep opportunity three, 
which happens in part while the circadian clock is promoting sleep, but also in part when it's promoting wakefulness. And the effect here is not as strong, but it's still present. And in sleep opportunity four, when light exposure happens when the circadian clock is promoting wake, we see no effects again. Meaning that if your circadian clock is promoting sleep and you're exposed to high intensity lighting, you go to sleep, you sleep better, more consolidated. And this is not just in our objective measures of so polysomnography, but also our subjective sleep quality scores present this. So if we look at how well people feel like they slept, we see that there's a parabolic curve in which people feel they sleep a lot better when they're exposed to high intensity lighting at these two sleep opportunities when the circadian clock is promoting wake, uh, sorry, promoting sleep. And the effect is not as strong when light exposure occurs when the circadian clock is promoting actual wakefulness. And of course, so there's a beautiful alignment between our subjective sleep quality scores, the amount of wakefulness we see, so wakefulness, um, and meaning that when you look at this, of course, this is a very specific combination, right? Like who is awake when the circadian clock is actually promoting sleep and who is exposed to lighting then? And that is, of course, the shift workers. And there might be many reasons why being exposed to high intensity lighting is not good for shift workers. I know there are some metabolic reasons, but these data at least seem to suggest that high intensity lighting is great for sleep and sleep quality and probably also subsequent sleep and sleep quality. So this data suggests that it might be good to be exposed to high intensity lighting when you are working the night shift. Now, lastly, most of the experiments that I've shown are under highly controlled or semi-controlled circumstances, but this is a study that we did in, um, uh, it's a field study, so under less controlled circumstances. So we wanted to see if light influences the deg degree of sleep fragmentation. Because if we look here, we see a strong effect on wakefulness. So we wanna see if light exposure during the daytime can influence how consolidated our sleep is. So how much we wake up after sleep onset. So we analyzed the data of the, the Mr. Oz um, data set, and this is a publicly available data set. So um, you're welcome to check it out. It's a, it's a very nice data set actually in which they collected activity data of, I think about 600 individuals, including light exposure levels. And we analyzed this actigraphy data uh, using non-parametric um, analysis in which we calculated the degree of sleep-wake fragmentation. This is called intradaily variation, in which higher intradaily variation means a more fragmented sleep-wake rhythm. And if we plot out the degree of sleep-wake rhythm to the amount of lighting that they're exposed to on a daily basis based on these ACTI watches, we see that there's a beautiful relationship in which people that are exposed to low amounts of lighting have more, sorry, people that are exposed to a lot of lighting have very little sleep-wake fragmentation, whereas people that are exposed to little lighting have much more sleep-wake fragmentation. Now, most of the sleep and circadian scientists know that these ACTI watches are a great way of approximating light intensity, but they're not so good at distinguishing low intensities from slightly higher intensities. I think one thing that they do very accurately is distinguishing indoor light exposure versus outdoor light exposure. So if you measure light intensities above a thousand lux, we can be pretty sure that you're outside. And interestingly, and luckily, this pattern holds when you look at outdoor light exposure. So people that are exposed to a lot of outdoor light that spend a lot of time outdoors, so this is time above threshold, so time that they spend above a thousand lux, they have a lot less sleep-wake fragmentation than people that are exposed to very little daytime lighting. So people that are exposed to more light, they sleep better, more consolidated. And if you compare these two, you can say, okay, at which time of day is this light exposure so important? So you can design um, uh, receiving operating characteristic curves and you can look at some of the statistical measures to see at which time of day is this light exposure important. And interestingly, and, and um, opposite of our expectations, I guess, we found that when people are exposed to high intensity lighting or outdoor lighting about seven hours after habitual sleep offset, 
there's the best sleep-wake consolidation. So the best differentiation between those with low sleep-wake consolidation from high sleep-wake consolidation happens about seven hours after habitual sleep offset. Meaning this is a time of day when there is no effect on timing of the circadian clock. If you remember the, the uh, phase response curve I showed in the beginning, this is a time of day where you don't expect any phase advances or any phase delays. So there has to be a different um, underlying circadian mechanism potentially that contributes to it. And we think it might be a circadian amplitude effect. So this is a phase amplitude resetting map in which you can plot out the change in um, um, uh, phase and amplitude relative to a lighting effect. And around 30 degrees is the morning. So this is where you usually find a phase advance. And while you can find a change, so the um, open squares uh, is after bright light exposure and the dark squares are after dim light exposure. So you can find a change in circadian phase if you're exposed to light in the morning, but not so much in circadian amplitude. So there's an effect on phase, but not amplitude. But if we look about seven hours later, so seven hours after habitual sleep offset, we don't find a change in phase almost, like it's at the same degree, but there's an effect on circadian amplitude. So our hypothesis is that this effect of seven hours after habitual sleep offset might be due to increasing the circadian clock amplitude. And this is something that we're very eager to explore um, in an intervention study. Now, I want to end off with talking a little bit about lighting and reporting of lighting, because I talk a lot about lighting. And interestingly, if we look at all the study or a lot of studies that report non-image forming effects of lighting, um, all of them report lighting measures, but not all of them report the same lighting measures. And actually, if we look at about 19 studies, not one of all these studies um, report the same lighting measure across all articles. And I think this is really important because in the end, if we want to combine results, like we already deal with heterogeneity in study design. So people use different study designs, different age group, different output measures. So one thing that we can at least standardize is how we report the lighting measure. And then we can try and combine data sets to get generalizable results. So I would always say, especially to, to the other fellow scientists here in the audience, I would encourage you to check out the NLIGHT um, checklist, which is a checklist that we, um, 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 that we um, achieved through a Delphi consensus method in which we encourage authors to report the same lighting output so we can generalize findings. And if you do, for example, uh, a review of the literature, you can combine the outputs of these studies because they will all um, uh, report approximately the same output measures. So check it out. Um, it's, a, it's a nice paper, I think. So a small summary, because my time is almost up. I started off by talking a little bit about the timing of the circadian clock or circadian clock phase. And um, the circadian clock influences many aspects of human physiology. It can be changed by continuous lighting but it can be delayed three times more effectively when you're exposed to flashes of light. So in terms of alertness and cognitive performance, high intensity lighting in the lab can influence subjective alertness, but at very limited times of day. It has profound effect on cognitive performance. And during the regular day, high intensity lighting might be beneficial for mental performance, even though this may not be perceived as such. Sleep quality, high intensity in the lab improves objective and subjective markers of sleep, but particularly when the circadian clock is promoting wakefulness. High intensity lighting in the field is associated with more consolidated sleep and is particularly important in the early afternoon for sleep-wake consolidation. And we think this might be an effect of circadian amplitude. So with that, I would really like to thank all the people that contributed to all the work that I showed today. Um, from Stanford University, my current mentor, Jamie Seitzer, from University of Groningen, my previous supervisors, Domin Beersma and Rulof Hutt, and the postdoc, Tom Boulders, and from Chrono at work, Marijke Gordijn. And please connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, ResearchGate. I'm everywhere. Thank you for listening.